Gildas, on the other hand, perhaps a little less than a century later, Gildas is the exact opposite. Gildas writes a Latin which most readers regard as intensely annoying. <laughs> it's extremely stylish, it's convoluted, it is deeply averse to saying anything simply, it shows off shamelessly, it alludes to literary sources, both classical and Christian. It's just a little... Good evening, Rowan. It's the 2nd of December 2016, and it's about quarter to 11. And obviously this is my usual Friday evening video to reassure you that I won't be seducing any priests over the weekend, so you can relax. <laughs> because obviously... I'm saving myself for my beloved, who I'm going to be with the moment that you're in jail. <laughs> and he's so wonderful, and we're made for each other. Anyway, I thought we could have a chat this evening about the first lecture that you gave at the British Library in October um, 2016. The 10th of October, this lecture you gave um, about somebody called Gildas, who was around in the 6th century in Britain um, and I've already commented on the other two lectures in this series of three I did them in reverse order because I found they got more entertaining as you went along <laughs> anyway as I've said before I don't know a lot about this period of history uh, so I'm just going to comment in a more personal way shall we say on a couple of things that I've picked out of this lecture so here we go. Oh, by the way, I hope you enjoyed the clip um, I've just played now, uh, because it really sounded like you were describing yourself. <laughs> so I'm going on to talk about another clip now. The book he writes on the downfall and conquest of Britain, this is Gilda she's talking about, is a mixture of sermon, history and polemic, and you emphasise polemic, I practice a lot of polemic, don't I? <laughs> it begins with a wildly inaccurate history of Roman Britain. <laughs> well, you give wildly inaccurate histories of absolutely everything, and especially when it comes to my life, you've gone around the world giving a wildly inaccurate uh, history of me, haven't you? <laughs> It begins with a wildly inaccurate history of Roman Britain and proceeds to a character assassination of five Western British monarchs. I'm assuming you're identifying with the Western British monarchs because you are from Western Britain, aren't you? Uh, and I'm from Eastern Britain. <laughs> and you think I'm assassinating your character um, because you think that you're God and that you're absolutely perfect and that we should all worship and adore you, and say whatever you want, and give you whatever you want, and anyone who doesn't do this is demonic, basically. This is how you define things, as I've illustrated in the past. <laughs> so, let me make this clear, Rowan. I'm pointing out the way that you're behaving, and I'm backing it up with evidence and examples. Now, you've actually assassinated my character haven't you um so it's the other way around you take part in character assassination um and you don't substantiate what you're saying with any evidence whatsoever and you do it to other people i've mentioned you're doing it to donald trump as well um saying that he was making racist remarks about Muslims and Mexicans, but you didn't provide any examples of that. Um, so you were assassinating my character, telling people I was a prostitute, when you knew perfectly well that I wasn't a prostitute, because you knew where I was actually working, <laughs> because you were interfering in that as well. Um, so you're the one who practices character assassination. I'm simply drawing attention to the way that you behave and offering an interpretation of that and I'm backing it up with examples from things that you clearly say in videos and articles and so on. Um, so I don't take part in character assassination. I've never assassinated anyone's character and I'm not assassinating your character. You're assassinating mine. 
So anyway, so you say he proceeds to a character assassination of five Western British monarchs, concluded with a dogged and eloquent trawl through all the books of the Latin Bible, extracting all those things which denounce God's people for their unfaithfulness and applying those texts to the British of his own time. Uh, well, if I were to trawl through the Latin Bible or any Bible and come up with every text that condemned you, then I'd never get to the end of making videos. Uh, but I have illustrated <laughs> condemnations of you from texts in the Bible before, uh, because as I've said, you misrepresent biblical texts and you make statements like, um, there's a long history of reconciliation in Christianity and things like this. And you talk about being reunited and reconciled and you use biblical text to illustrate this. Um, but you never mention the long tradition in Christianity of the damned going to hell. And you're one of the damned the way that you go in uh, because you think you're absolutely perfect. You've usurped the place of God. Um, and you behave in a very immoral way. You've been responsible with your propaganda for countless deaths in the Middle East um, and in Afghanistan. <laughs> and uh, you've ruined a good number of lives as well with your personal touch and driven some people to suicide. Um, so it's quite easy. You don't have to trawl too far through the Bible to find a text condemning you. And in fact, there's countless of them. But you never seem to quote those for some mysterious reason. <laughs> In fact, you often say it says the opposite of what it does say. So you then say, but what's important in the structure of the book for our purpose is that he clearly expects his readers to know what he's talking about. Uh, well, you clearly expect me to know what you're talking about, don't you, in this Schrodinger's conversation that's both happening and not happening at the same time, according to your evil old hag of a wife. Um, so you then say, he tells us at one point that he's hesitated to put his book in the public arena because of modesty and various other reasons which he doesn't specify. Some of those reasons were probably precisely that there would have been readers of the book in the courts of the kings about whom he is so rude in Western Britain. And uh, you quite emphasise rude there as well. I expect you think I'm being rude to you in pointing out all the times that you mention sex and allude to sex in your public discourse, which, as I've said, is quite unusual for anyone, not just the Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> but it's you who's been rude, isn't it? Uh, you're exceptionally rude because you're thinking about sex all the time and you're mentioning it uh, when it's not relevant. <laughs> and it's not even like, as I've said, you're a stand-up comedian making risque comments to make people laugh um, because joking about taboo subjects makes people laugh. It's an element of comedy. Um, but uh, you kind of don't really expect the Archbishop of Canterbury to be doing that on quite such a regular basis. And the fact that you've done it so much on video as well, um, of course, most of what you say isn't on video, so you're probably doing it even more. <laughs> He's so rude in Western Britain. The people about whom he is so rude in Western Britain. Well, you're from Western Britain, aren't you, from Wales? So you then say, but he assumes, therefore, that he's not the only educated man in 6th century Britain. You emphasise man there. Um, I suppose that's supposed to mean something. Wasn't Hilda of Whitby very educated? Um, I think she was, you know. I can't remember whether she was around in the 6th century. Uh, it might have been before that, actually, but uh, Bede wrote about her, so it was around that time. So they did have abbesses in charge of monasteries. Hilda of Whitby was in charge of a monastery that had both men and women in it, in different sections, I suppose. Uh, but she was quite educated, I believe. <laughs> so if you're trying to imply 
that it was only men who were educated in the 6th century in Britain. You're wrong. <laughs> he assumes there's a public, for what he writes, a public which will appreciate slightly self-consciously fine writing that will share his slightly old-fashioned tone that will recognise allusions to Virgil and appreciate Ciceronian elegance of his arguments and you emphasise argument there. So I think you're talking about yourself here again, aren't you? Because I certainly recognise your allusions and I'd already talked in videos about you alluding to sex <laughs> quite a lot. <laughs> Um, so you think your arguments are elegant, do you? You don't actually have any arguments, do you? All we get is flannel and impressionistic bullshit. <laughs> and then, this is really, really interesting, you leave a two-second pause, about two seconds anyway, and then you say, where did he learn his rhetoric? And then you leave another pause for five seconds, and say, we can't of course answer that question, and he gives us no clues at all. Um, so I've talked about you employing rhetoric, and you don't disseminate any facts and that kind of thing. Um, and only the day before this lecture, I uploaded a video uh, which was explaining well, it was talking about a lecture that you gave in the United States at an Episcopalian seminary in Tennessee um, and it was a question from the audience about the rise of nationalism and you were very concerned about this rise of nationalism and you saw it as being linked to the rise of the Third Reich or being a similar um, thing happening, this rise of nationalism with the Brexit vote and Donald Trump's campaign in America, he hadn't been elected then. Um, and I said, well, the trouble is the things that you're complaining about <laughs> were all engineered by the people who were puppeteering you. And I showed several examples, like Hitler being a Rothschild um, and the fact that the European Union was all planned at the Bilderberg Group in the 1950s. And I also pointed out that... Um, Tony Blair had appointed you the first Archbishop of Canterbury to be appointed from outside of England since 1414 and that it's unprecedented in Anglican history to have any Archbishop of Canterbury appointed from outside of England. And then I showed a video clip of um, Tony Blair being questioned about being at the Bilderberg Group, which he admitted that he was there in 1993. Um, and then a clip of Claire Short saying that um, Tony Blair was absolutely desperate to get Britain in the Euro and had told Gordon Brown, who was Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time, that he'd um, resign as Prime Minister and let Gordon Brown run the country if only he'd let him, Tony Blair, join the Euro. So I think that all of this was connected, including you being appointed Archbishop of, of Canterbury. And so you're saying this the day after, um, so you're talking about the elegance of your argument, leaving a two second pause and saying, where did he learn his rhetoric? Then leaving a five second pause and then saying, we can't of course answer that question and he gives us no clues at all. Uh, well, I've <laughs> I've seen a lot of clues in things that you've been saying, lying about 9-11 and going on about the environmental crisis, the bogus global warming um, fiasco <laughs> and all this kind of thing. And uh, I've been drawing attention to these things in videos that I've made as well. So you've learnt your rhetoric uh, from the CIA manual on simple subversion and uh, your handlers in the intelligence agencies have told you what to say and how to argue and the things to argue for as well. So that's where you learnt your rhetoric. The book he writes, the book we can be sure he wrote, there are a couple of slightly contested um, works also attributed to him in other contexts, but the main book on the downfall and conquest of Britain is a mixture of sermon, history, 
and polemic. It begins with a wildly inaccurate history of Roman Britain and proceeds to a character assassination of five Western British monarchs, concluding with a dogged and eloquent trawl through all the books of the Latin Bible, extracting all those things which denounce God's people for their unfaithfulness and applying those texts to the British of his own time. But what's important in the structure of the book for our purpose is, as I said earlier, that he clearly expects his readers to know what he's talking about. He tells us at one point that he's hesitated to put his book in the public arena because of modesty and various other reasons which he doesn't specify. Some of those reasons were probably precisely that there would have been readers of the book in the courts of the kings about whom he is so rude in Western Britain. But he assumes, therefore, that he's not the only educated man in 6th century Britain. He assumes there's a public for what he writes, a public which will appreciate slightly self-consciously fine writing, that will share his slightly old-fashioned tone, that will recognize allusions to Virgil and appreciate the Ciceronian elegance of his argument. Where did he learn his rhetoric? We can't, of course, answer that question, and he gives us no clues at all. So you go on to say later in this lecture, Milgen, he says, was as a young man educated by a magister elegans, a refined teacher, and you emphasise the word teacher here, the refined teacher of almost all of Britain. Um, so I think you're identifying yourself as a refined teacher of almost all of Britain. You certainly do think uh, that you've got some fantastic wisdom and insight that other people don't have and that you're holy and close to God and so close to God that you are in fact God. Uh, so <laughs> I think you are referring to yourself here as a refined teacher, the refined teacher of almost all of Britain. Mile gun, as a youth, in other words, is taught the kind of thing that Gildas has been taught or has been taught by whatever this means in the context, a national reputation. Um, so I think you're talking about yourself here as a national figure. Um, and you probably think that your national reputation is going to save you from any allegations I make about you, even though I'm illustrating these things with evidence, whereas you don't illustrate anything that you say with evidence, do you? It's all Im impressionistic bullshit. And also, you got an awful lot of criticism when you were Archbishop of Canterbury in the national media. So I wouldn't argue that you've got a national reputation um, but I wouldn't bank on it being a good one if I were you. <laughs> and in any case, by the time I finish drawing attention to all your lunacy and lies, uh, you certainly won't have a good reputation. Um, and besides which, your reputation doesn't mean much when you're in jail, does it? So you then say, it's tempting to think, and some have succumbed to the temptation. Uh, well, you succumb to temptation all the time, don't you, Rowan? <laughs> so, some have succumbed to the temptation that Gildas himself studied with the same person. Uh, so, did you study with David Pete then, your pretend astrophysical clergy friend, uh, who, by the way, did have an association with Cambridge University. I think it was Clare College, Cambridge, which you uh, were also associated with. I, be I believe you held some post there, weren't you? The dean or something like that there at Clare College, and so was he. Um, at Clare College, I mean, although you wouldn't have overlapped, but they have a lot of reunions at Cambridge colleges, don't they? So it's not impossible that you came across him there 
already. But in any case, you were following me around the country everywhere I went and telling lies about me and inciting people to treat me in an evil way. Uh, so you'll have been feeding him a pack of lies anyway, won't you? And puppeteering him and telling him what to do, along with some other people in that congregation as well. Um, so, and uh, the other factor is that he did say in a sermon once that he knew you personally. Uh, so if that isn't the case, then you really need to take that up with him, don't you? He said that in... Um, 2002 by the way that was the year you were appointed Archbishop of Canterbury and there were all these rumours going along around which there always are when they're about to appoint a new Archbishop of Canterbury who it might be and so there were articles about various possibilities in the papers um, and he was talking about that in a sermon and he said that uh, you were far superior in intellect and holiness to anyone else and anyone who knew about you would know this and that he knew you personally so that's what he said in a sermon in 2002 which really annoyed a member of the congregation i didn't say anything about it actually but somebody was um, talking to me afterwards and saying it was totally inappropriate of him to say that uh, so that's what he um he was saying in his sermon that he knew you personally um which wouldn't surprise me in the slightest and in any case you were puppeteering him weren't you so you then say fictions have been concocted about gilders and mild guns student friends alienated in later life uh so maybe that you're telling me that rowan i don't know <laughs> I think we can probably park those suggestions for the time being. But the point is that not only does he assume that the kings of Western Britain and their courts and their clerks would have known what he was talking about. Uh, so you're kind of assuming that I know what you're talking about and that you're going to be able to manipulate me. And also, of course, this lecture uh, was only a few weeks after you'd uh, given your famous lecture on the 19th of September um, at St Martin in the Fields where you were quoting from Sash songs I can't believe that tonight you're here with me or something to that effect um, and I just made a video about that a week or two before um, so <laughs> you kind of assume that I know what you're talking about which I do a lot of the time but sometimes I don't know what you're talking about uh, but as I keep saying you're not going to manipulate me um, but you don't seem to take that on board at all because you're as mad as a hatter but of course once again this is um, Schrodinger's conversation isn't it that's both happening and not happening at the same time so you then say he very specifically pins down one of those kings and reminds him of his early education. <laughs> You're not talking about S and M again, are you? <laughs> Pinning down kings. <laughs> he spent a brief portion of his youth in a monastery. Well, you spent some time in a monastery, didn't you? You were working at Murfield theological college which is also um, an anglican monastery and you were thinking about becoming a monk as well at one point weren't you allegedly um, and then you found out that it was going to be a bit harder to be um, <laughs> screwing a lot of women so you probably gave up on that idea then <laughs> didn't you have an unhappy love affair when you were in Murfield as well i think you did and you got over it by writing poetry according to you and visiting prostitutes in Leeds obviously but it doesn't say that in your biography so he spent a brief portion of his youth in a monastery and then thought better of it and embarked on the kind of career more readily associated with 6th century British kings in Gildas's eyes that is a career of more or less uninterrupted homicide and fornication. Um, so you are talking about yourself, aren't you? Apologies. Mulgan, he says, was, as a young man, educated by a Magister Elegans, 
a refined teacher, the refined teacher of almost all of Britain. Malgun, as a youth, in other words, is taught the kind of thing that Gildas is being taught, or has been taught, by someone with, whatever this means in the context, a national reputation. It's tempting to think, and some have succumbed to the temptation, that Gildas himself studied with the same person. Fictions have been concocted about Gildas and Mylgun as student friends alienated in later life. I think we can probably park those suggestions for the time being. But the point is that not only does he assume that the kings of Western Britain and their courts and their clerks would have known what he was talking about, he very specifically pins down one of those kings and reminds him of his early education. He also describes how Malgun spent a brief portion of his youth in a monastery and then thought better of it and embarked on the kind of career more readily associated with 6th century British kings in Gildas's eyes, that is a career of more or less uninterrupted homicide and fornication. So this is my favourite bit here from later on in the lecture. Book collections, in other words, would probably be the preserve of the wealthy villa-dwelling elite, which fits rather nicely into the picture we've just imagined of St Ilted and people like him, magistry masters, highly educated individuals from the governing class who would perhaps attract to themselves a significant community of students and would have assembled a significant collection of literature. So you emphasise masters here, uh, St Ilted and people like him, magistry masters, and you're the master of modelling College Cambridge, aren't you? And these masters are highly educated individuals. So you're talking about yourself again from the governing class. So you think you're from the governing class. You're not, in fact, from the governing class, although you're in the House of Lords, I suppose. Uh, but the people who are really governing, who are in charge of everything, are just your puppet masters, aren't they? <laughs> So you're not really governing, are you? You're just doing as you're told. <laughs> you're being governed more than anybody. <laughs> so the governing class would perhaps attract to themselves a significant community of students. Uh, so don't be hoping to attract me, Rowan, because you're absolutely hideous. <laughs> <laughs> the mere thought of you makes me want to vomit up my entire innards. <laughs> and in any case, I'm saving myself for my beloved because he's so wonderful and we're made for each other. Book collections, in other words, would probably be the preserve of the wealthy villa-dwelling elite, which fits rather nicely into the picture we've just imagined of St. Ilted and people like him. Magistry, masters, highly educated individuals from the governing class who would perhaps attract to themselves a significant community of students and would have assembled a significant collection of literature. Lord Williams is a former Archbishop of Canterbury and currently Master of Magdalen College in Cambridge. And late that night when the Lord came home inquiring of his lady O, The servant said on every hand she's gone with the raggle tackle gypsies O. Right, so you go on to say then later on. So these are educational institutions on the border between the ecclesial and the civic. So I think you're spinning yourself a yarn here. You're spinning yourself a little fantasy uh, that you've got some kind of civic role, or at least you did have as Archbishop of Canterbury, that you don't in fact have. Now, the Church of England is an established church, so you do get to sit in the House of Lords um, and things like that. But... Um, it's still quite a limited role, really. It's not the same as the role that you cast in four bishops in the later part 
of the Roman Empire. The Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity at the beginning of the 4th century and there was Christianity then became the official religion of the Roman Empire um, and there was this merging of the church and state back then um, and you seem to think it's still like that and you still have some kind of civic role and I think you're spinning this out here um, so you've got this civic role uh, more than what is actually the case and more than what was the case when you were Archbishop of Canterbury but you've created this fantasy world in which you're more important in every sphere of life than you are and uh, as I've said earlier in this video you really think that you're a very wise and intellectual and holy person and you should be um, <laughs> treating the benighted masses in a humane way and uh, dictating to them what the right course of action is. Of course the reality is you're amoral, you're completely mad <laughs> and you're just trying to uh, manipulate everybody to go the way that you want them to and you want everyone praising and adoring you as well because obviously you're God aren't you in Rowan world. <laughs> So you then say, not great monastic libraries such as developed after Cassiodorus in the West. There's no British Monte, Monte Cassino, but communities where education was offered in ways that reflected classical Roman convention and which also educated people for a public life in the church. And this is perhaps another thing worth considering here. People were being educated for public life in this way, undoubtedly. But increasingly in Britain, as elsewhere, that public life was going to be largely centred around the survival of the church. So are you talking about the survival of the church or the survival of you? <laughs> the church, which in the Western Roman Empire was all that was left of the old imperial civil service, one of the great differences between the Western Roman Empire and the Eastern in the period between, say, 400 and 600 is the virtual disappearance in Western Europe of an educated lay professional class, you emphasise lay there, which survives in the East. Bishops took over the reins of administration in so many contexts, not least in cities, largely because nobody else could do it. Well, I think that's how you'd like it to be, Rowan, now, isn't it? That nobody else could do anything and that you're the only educated person and nobody's allowed to contradict you. And, of course, you've got this national reputation, which I just mentioned not long ago. Uh, and so, uh, you know, you're the authority and anyone who questions you is by default wrong. <laughs> You have to spin these fantasies, don't you? Because you can't present any evidence. So you then say they could read. They knew their ways around libraries. They knew how to deploy texts. They knew how to speak in public. Well, I know how to speak in public as well, Rowan. I was a health and safety trainer for a start. Um, that's how I knew you were lying about 9-11 straight away as soon as I heard you talking about putting masks on. <laughs> that you found in an office building in the financial district of New York. Um, so you then say they knew how to decide cases in law. So this is bishops between the 4th and the 6th century, but I think you're identifying yourself as such a person, being a bishop, even though you're completely null and utterly void. And... <laughs> So, they knew how to decide cases in law, and one factor which has not, I think, been taken into consideration enough in this particular context, uh, so I'm not sure that you're talking about the context of the 4th to the 6th century, I think you're talking about your context and this context. Uh, in this particular context is that from the time of the Emperor Constantine's legitimation of Christianity at the beginning of the 4th century, bishops were expected to settle disputes in law within their jurisdiction. 
Uh, well, that isn't the case now, is it, Rowan? I mean, I know the Church of England is a state church and therefore uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury and some other Church of England bishops sit in the House of Lords. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you've got a kind of legal rule within society as a whole, does it? I've, that's quite limited. You can only speak in the House of Lords and vote on things, and that's it, really. Um, and you're not even allowed to vote in elections, are you, because you're in the House of Lords? So, <laughs> so well, there we are. <laughs> So it's a very limited role that you have in relation to the state and it's clearly defined. So you don't have any jurisdiction at all to be settling disputes in law. Um, so in other words, this is what you're saying, in other words, they were allowed to and encouraged to act as magistrates um, so you were seeing yourself, I assume, acting as a magistrate um, in having me thrown out of St Michael's Church to try and force me to involve myself with David Pete. And I know that you were, that's what you intended uh, because of a talk that you gave at the Greenbelt Festival a few months later, which I've already talked about on YouTube. Uh, but I didn't know about that at the time. I only came across it a lot later anyway, after I started researching you. And then I realised what w that was all about. And you were using techniques of trauma-based mind control. Um, to add to all your other vices, you're actually a mind control handler as well. And I've already made a video about that, at least one video, and I think more than one. Um, so you've got no authority to be acting as a magistrate. And since I'd made an allegation of uh, criminal offences against these people, then they should have been reported to the police. And at the very least... Um, they should have been investigated in the church and they never were. All you did was act in a way to force me to do what you wanted me to do. Um, so, and that was a technique of trauma-based mind control. Um, and so you then say, and the kind of literary and rhetorical education that we've been speaking of as typical of Gildas's background and the background of others is the education that would very definitely fit somebody for that kind of role. Uh, so I've talked about you using rhetoric. Um, so you think that you are equipped for that kind of role, where you're not really because you're a psychopath and you don't hold that office anyway. It doesn't matter whether you're equipped for it or not anyway. If you don't hold that office, then you can't act as a magistrate, can you? You've got no authority for doing that kind of thing. And if you were a magistrate, um, and you were acting in the way that you act, then you could be held accountable for that as well. Um, so, you know, sir, so it may very well be that what we've, what we're seeing in Ilfted, and perhaps there's other communities or settlements that we can guess at, is a kind of staff college for bishops. A staff college that is for clergy expected to settle public disputes to know their way around enough Roman law to see what a good argument might look like. Um, so you're not expected to settle public disputes that are outside uh, your jurisdiction. Maybe as Archbishop of Canterbury, you could have um, settled disputes about doctrine or order in the church or something like that. Uh, but in any case, I would also point out that the Church of England is divided into two provinces. The province of Canterbury, which is the jurisdiction of the Archbishop of Canterbury, and the province of York, which is the jurisdiction of the Archbishop of York. And since the church I was thrown out of was in the province of York, then you shouldn't have been interfering in it in the first place, should you? And certainly not stopping uh, the diocesan bishop or the Archbishop of York from conducting an investigation. So you were puppeteering the whole of that. And also I would point out that um, when I first came to the Church of England, back to England again in 1994, I left the church in Wales, which is an entirely separate 
province of the Anglican Communion and you were still interfering uh, then when you were still Archbishop of Wales. And so for between 1994 and 2002, you were hounding me around England and you were a bishop in Wales and then subsequently subsequently Archbishop of Wales so that was outside your jurisdiction as well so I hope you're not thinking I'm going to be taken in by this bullshit on top of all the other bullshit that you've come out with <laughs> so and you talk about what a good argument might look like well it's all about appearance with you isn't it Rowan um there's no substance to it. I've talked about this before as well in relation to a um, a poem of uh, St John of the Cross and a theme in um, 16th century Spanish literature of ser and parather, being and seeming or appearing. Um, and you're all about seeming and appearing, aren't you? And there's absolutely no substance to you. You don't provide any evidence and you don't have any inherent identity even. I mean, you don't even think that words have inherent meaning. You think you can redefine them. So it's all about what things look like to you. So I'm not concerned what good arguments look like. I'm concerned with good arguments being good arguments and not just a lot of obfuscation, flannel, rhetoric, <laughs> um, disingenuous manipulative the kind of thing that you come out with all the time you never seem to convey any real facts um so you then say you say so you say yeah, that uh, the bishops knew their way around enough roman law to see what a good argument might look like what evidence might count in court and who would bring to that enough civil elegance to be persuasive in public discussion uh, so what you're saying the day after um, I'd put this video up about uh, you being the first Archbishop of Canterbury from outside of England since the 14th century and the fact that you're always promoting these globalist things like the European Union and that you were appointed by Tony Blair um, and Tony Blair uh, was obsessed with getting Britain in the Euro and all of that which I mentioned earlier in the video and you're saying I think that this is evidence that wouldn't count in court um, and of course also you'd been immediately prior to this in the last few weeks before this lecture quoting sash lyrics at me I can't believe that tonight you're here with me when you thought I was in the audience <laughs> Well, there's a lot more evidence than that, isn't there, about things that you've been doing in the background concretely and other people who would have said what you told them to say and do. Uh, so it's not just about what I'm saying on video, is it, Rowan? <laughs> and in any case, I don't care what they put you in jail for. I don't even care about you being in jail at all, just as long as nobody ever listens to another lying word that comes out of your mouth uh, but I would put, point out that they jailed Al Capone for tax evasion uh, so I don't care what you're in jail for just as long as nobody believes another word that you say. So you then say so I suspect we may behind Gildas say not only the kind of library I've indicated of ecclesiastical and secular resource but the kind of educational community that seeks to equip the clergy in a collapsing social order for the maintenance of what order could still be made workable. Uh, so you're talking about ecclesiastical and secular resource behind Gildas and you're kind of presenting yourself as Gildas um, in this talk, aren't you? By the way, I hope you like the picture of yourself that's been on the last two clips. Um, I think this one and the last one, which was taken earlier this week. <laughs> on Monday of this week. Um, about the 28th of November, I think it was. So there you are in all your glory at Church House in London, um, teetering on the edge. <laughs> 
So you think you've been equipped with ecclesiastical and secular resource, although that's the impression you're trying to convey to me. Um, but I know you're just talking crap as usual, so don't bother. Anyway, I shall leave it there for this evening because I've been talking quite a long time and obviously I need to put my video together on YouTube. And then I need a long night to be dreaming about my beloved and his magnificent feet all night long, don't I? Uh, but don't forget to be alert because I will be turning up to arrest you for terrorism. <laughs> Hasta la próxima! So these are educational institutions on the border between the ecclesial and the civic. Not great learned monastic libraries such as developed after Cassiodorus in the West. There's no British Monte Cassino. But communities where education was offered in ways that reflected classical Roman convention and which also educated people for a public life in the church. And this perhaps is another thing worth considering here. People were being educated for public life in this way, undoubtedly. But increasingly in Britain as elsewhere, that public life was going to be largely centered around the survival of the church. The church, which in the Western Roman Empire, was all that was left of the old imperial civil service. One of the great differences between the Western Roman Empire and the Eastern, in the period between, say, 400 and 600, is the virtual disappearance in Western Europe of an educated lay professional class, which survives in the East. Bishops took over the reins of administration in so many contexts, not least in cities, largely because nobody else could do it. They could read. They knew their ways around libraries. They knew how to deploy texts. They knew how to speak in public. They knew how to decide cases in law. And one factor which has not, I think, been taken into consideration enough in this particular context is that from the time of the Emperor Constantine's legitimation of Christianity at the beginning of the fourth century, bishops were expected to settle disputes in law within their jurisdiction. In other words, they were allowed to and encouraged to act as magistrates. And the kind of literary and rhetorical education that we've been speaking of as typical of Gildas's background and that of others is the education that would very definitely fit somebody for that kind of role. So it may very well be that what we're seeing in Iltid, and perhaps there's other communities or settlements that we can guess at, is a kind of staff college for bishops. A staff college, that is, for clergy expected to settle public disputes, to know their way around enough Roman law to see what a good argument might look like, or what evidence might count in court, and who would bring to that enough civil elegance to be persuasive in public discussion. So, I suspect we may, behind Gildas, see not only the kind of library I've indicated of ecclesiastical and secular resource, but the kind of educational community that seeks to equip the clergy in a collapsing social order for the maintenance of what order could still be made workable. Oh yes, and I've just remembered, you've actually been arrested before, haven't you, in 1985 for breaking into an American Air Force base and singing psalms on the runway. Um, and I had read and heard uh, prior to all of this situation coming to my attention that you were fined for this and that your college paid the fine. Um, but for some reason now you seem to need to insist 
um, that you weren't charged with anything. <laughs> now, uh, you've mentioned this quite a few times when people have asked you about it. Um, I was arrested, but I wasn't charged. So I think this is the fantasy that you've got in your head as to what the outcome um, is going to be. Because you've been arrested already, haven't you? Um, and you haven't been charged yet. <laughs> so this is what uh, you're thinking about. I was arrested, but I wasn't charged. But don't worry, Rowan, you will be this time. Hasta la próxima. Okay, 1985-ish then, and coming to the end of the Cold War and the end of the Reagan era, and you participated in a CND march for which you got yourself nicked. And not quite the sort of behaviour one would have expected of a trainee chaplain as you were at the time. Or maybe it is exactly the sort of behaviour one well. would have expected. <laughs> Looking back on it now, Looking is it embarrassment or is it head held high? Um, I don't feel embarrassed about it, to be honest. The little group of Christian CND in Cambridge simply wanted, I think, to make a reasonably clear statement about why Christians might find nuclear weapons a bit of a problem. So on Ash Wednesday, we went up to Alconbury, the Air Force Base, US Air Force Base, a bit north of Cambridge, and um, held a little service on the runway with scattering of ashes. It was Ash Wednesday. We wanted to say, look, we are all complicit in a situation which really we ought to be repentant about. So we climbed over the wire. We said some prayers and were rounded up at gunpoint. And uh, the trouble was, I think, they couldn't think of what to charge us with. We hadn't actually cut the wire. We hadn't actually damaged anything. Trespass. Trespass. But of course, that's not automatically a criminal offence. So, oh. uh, <laughs> so we were eventually disgorged onto the streets of Huntington at about two o'clock in the morning. And told not to do it again, because next time it would be bad. Now, I suspect that very few uh, academics let alone deans, can match his street cred from that time. An arrest and fine in a 1985 campaign for nuclear disarmament protest, which was at Lake and Heath Air Base. And I gather he sang psalms. And so I very warmly welcome Dr. Rowan Williams to speak on plagues and metaphor. Thank you very much indeed, Master. Um, I should perhaps say for the sake of um, absolute truthfulness, arrested but never fined. <laughs> they didn't quite decide what to charge me with.
have the best sex. Adelante. Adelante.